Good morning. If you want to open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew this morning, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, as we start a new series here at First Baptist Broken Arrow called Beat the Curve, Moving Upward When Life is Upside Down. Our entire life right now is getting used to a new normal, is being comfortable being uncomfortable. Why? Because we are trying to beat a curve. We are trying to literally change the trajectory of our country for the safety of our homes and the betterment of our lives. And so we are social distancing. We are isolating. We are disrupting our workplace. Why? Because we are trying to better our lives. So what if we had those same principles spiritually? What if we admitted that there are things, fear, worry, anxiety, depression, that come at us in Christ? And instead of just trying to go with the flow, what if we said, no, we want to have a time where we we beat the curve, where we change our lives. And so what we're going to do for the next five weeks is that we're going to focus on Jesus, and we're going to take biblical principles, and we're going to attack in Christ fear and worry and anxiety and depression. Now I'm going to teach you how to live in victory. And the one thing I want you to get for you walking around and do life today is that Jesus Jesus is here. Let's talk about how to beat the curve with fear. Jesus is here. Now, neuroscientists have confirmed to us that fear is a normal part of our brain function. God gave us physically an amygdala, which is literally the size of two almonds. And if you're not careful, this thing will drive you nuts. Fear is something that is naturally a part of who we are as made in the image of God. And most people fear generally four things. One, there, there's a fear of uncertainty. There, there's a fear of kind of wondering, okay, what, what exactly is coming next? I don't, what does the future hold? There's a natural fear that comes from our amygdala. There's also a fear of attention. Have you ever noticed when you walk into a room and you're like, hmm, is, 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 ever, is it anyone looking at me? Or, you know, there's just kind of that, that natural fear. Why? It comes from your amygdala. There's also, there's a fear of change. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really even need to explain this one. It just kind of, there's just kind of an unsettledness anytime there's this normal pattern in our lives. And that's why I think God is right now has been so kind to us because there is no normal, that, that we are kind of comfortable now being uncomfortable. And as a result of that, God is going to do something that he's only going to get the glory for. But that's part of naturally who you are. You have an amygdala that Every time change comes, there's a little bit of fear. There's also a fear in regard to conflict. When we have unsettledness in relationships that we find comfort in or satisfaction in, when there is conflict, we kind of begin to, whoa, what is this? Fear can be crippling. It can be paralyzing. And when we detect fear is coming, we avoid it like the plague. Why? Because naturally fear is a part of our lives. Fear is also learned. We fear certain people in certain places in certain contexts. Why? Because we have negative associations or past experiences. That's why we, we have certain things that we just fear naturally, like spiders. I mean, I watched the scariest movie I've ever seen in my life was arachnophobia when I was a kid. Like why my parents let me watch this, I have no idea. But, but like literally, to, still today, I, I see a spider, I'm like, oh, is that, is that some, from some South American rainforest that you know, it just kind of naturally kind of goes into my mind. Why? Because there's a negative association or there's past experiences. People fear all sorts of things. They fear clowns. For some reason, I, I don't know. They, they fear vegetables. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's just me. So in light of that, we, we, we learn to, to have from negative associations or past experiences, we can learn to fear things. Fear is also then taught. We have the ability to create fear. Most fears are not real. Most fears are hypothetical contingencies that do not exist, which then means faith or fear will control your life. Most fears that plague us, most fears that encumber us, most fears that weigh us down do not even exist. They are coming from hypothetical contingencies in our mind, playing out scenarios that if we're not careful, instead of living by faith, we will be enslaved by fear, which then means fear is a choice. Now think about this in Christ. What fear outside of you is greater than Jesus in you? None. Which means that you have a choice today, that you can live in fear, be plagued by failure, or you can live by faith. God wants you to be free. God wants you to live a life of promise and of certainty in who he is. And that is why 365 separate times, literally 
One truth for every day of the year. God commands you, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Why? Because Jesus is here. Let's beat this curb of fear. With that in mind, let's direct our hearts to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Now, when we come to Matthew chapter 8 and 9, it presents us here a series of miracles demonstrating that Jesus is the unlimited, powerful, almighty Son of God. Jesus is the central figure in Matthew, and he is given absolute authority by God the Father. And so Matthew, in chapters 8 through 9, gives nine separate miracles to demonstrate once and for all that Jesus is not a carpenter, from Nazareth. He is the one true almighty son of God. And he's going to show up to these disciples. And there's going to be this magnanimous storm that completely surprised, breathtakingly shocked them. And Jesus is going to provide peace and stillness. And the same Christ that was in the boat with these disciples resides in your heart and wants to do the same with your life. Regardless of what is going on in the storms of your life right now, in the storms of your relationships right now, God desires for you to have peace. Jesus is here. With that in mind, let's study verses 23 through 27. And your Bible says this, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, for we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. And then he rose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this? that even the wind and the seas obey him. Now, previously, Jesus had healed many and had just confronted some superficial followers of of Jesus about the true cost of following Jesus Christ. And now notice, before anyone else, Jesus enters into a small fishing craft, probably used by fishermen in the Sea of Galilee. Now, common fishing boats of the air were only eight meters long, 2.3 meters wide. You know, this isn't the, the USS Minnow here. And more than likely, historical commentators tell us that it could probably fit only about 13 people. But notice, Jesus gets into this boat and his disciples follow him. Now, something interesting. Did you realize that of the 35 miracles listed in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, seven of them deal with the sea. 20% of all miracles of Jesus Christ in the Gospels are dealing with the sea. You want to know why? Because Jesus is here and you need him. I, I'm always amazed by the ocean. I've, I've had the privilege of, uh, of living in different parts of our country and you know, being able to access the, the beautiful oceans that God has so blessed us with as a country. And I just absolutely love it. But it's, to me, it's terrifyingly suspenseful to realize if we truly knew what was in the ocean, we probably wouldn't be in the ocean. In fact, we, we always saw are eloquently exposed to this during Shark Week every, every year where, you know, you kind of see these images kind of transposed of kind of here's everyone playing on the beach. And literally, I mean, 25, 30, 50 yards away are these sharks, you know, the, the size of, you know, frankly, the USS Minnow here swimming around. And if we knew they were there, we would never be in there. But see, we don't see them. Thus, we don't fear them. And here in Matthew chapter 8, you have this imagery of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming upon this boat first, literally telling these men who is following him, look, if you follow me, there is safety and there's security. There's a direction. There's a purpose for your life. If you're truly going to follow me as a disciple, this is exactly how you're how to do life. If I'm there, you need to be there. And trust me, if I'm there, I'm here and I'm with you. And there's nothing in your life that you're ever going to be alone. There's never a time in your life where literally you are not going to be securely within the will and desire that I have for you. Jesus is here and you need him. It's an acknowledgement that when we trust and give our lives completely to the Lord, that God, we are wholeheartedly dependent upon your will and your love, and your control over our lives. And his disciples, verse 23, followed him. Now that word disciple there actually has no spiritual connotation at all in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. 
It just simply means you're a committed follower of a teacher or a master. In fact, did you realize that the word disciple appears 281 separate times in the New Testament? 250 times in the Gospels alone. A disciple is one who commits their life to following the teachings and thus lifestyles of a master. Now, when these disciples followed Jesus, some of them were the 12 that you know. They they would have literally seen Jesus do these miracles. They would have heard his teachings and they would have followed him onto this boat. It's literally here kind of conveying a continuous and complete action, a journey, a process that is daily dependent upon Jesus wherever he lives. And when we battle fear and when we try to live out by faith, not fear, we got to remind ourselves that the key to being fearless is being Jesus led. If we're not careful, we'll get that reversed. If we're not careful, we'll begin to kind of take autonomy of our own life, control of our own situations. And we'll just allow the Lord to kind of stand by and watch. That is not biblical discipleship. That is not the will of the Lord for your life. That is now how you can have freedom from fear. The key to being fearless is being Jesus led. In fact, let me encourage you this week. Why don't you open your Bibles? Grab a good cup of coffee and maybe a chicken biscuit somewhere. And, you know, why don't you just go to the New Testament? Focus on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four Gospels. And in most Bibles, anytime Jesus speaks, the words are in red. Why don't you, for this entire week, if we're going to beat the curve of fear, why don't we read the red? And you just start reading the words of Jesus and just start writing down truth, promises that stand out. And then pray those back to the Lord. Pray those in your relationship to others and encouragement of others. Then, why don't you tell somebody? (laughs) Why don't you go and say, did did you realize that I was reading the gospel of Matthew and and I'm seeing Jesus, how he interacts and how he talks. And and I I even, I studied a miracle this week in Matthew chapter eight. And man, these disciples have seen Jesus do amazing things and literally a storm rises up and it blows their mind. But yet the Lord was at rest. He was sleeping. He was calm. He was assured of who he was as a son of God. And that same assurance that I have as as now a, a son or daughter of the king, I'm trying to live my best life, not by fear, but by faith. Read the red, pray, and share that truth with others. Jesus is here. Now, notice what happens in verse 24. There arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. You see, strong northerly winds, usually in May to October, flow down from the Jordan Valley and combine with the warmer climates of the Galilean region. And subsequently, then violent, turbulent storms can quickly and suddenly and spontaneously appear without warning. And that's exactly what happened here. The, the word here, seismos, is, is where we get our word seismograph. It, it's how we measure earthquakes today. That, that's literally the impact of this storm. It was a shaking storm. It was a whirlwind. The King James Version said it's in a, in a tempest arose. I mean, any time you hear the phrase in a tempest arose, it's not good, right? So in light of that, this storm suddenly appears. It violently, surprisingly, dangerously shook the water and the boat. And these disciples, some of them were seasoned and generational fishermen. They were literally terrified. But notice what Jesus is doing in verse 24. He's asleep. (laughs) Jesus, naturally exhausted from his day of healing and teaching and supernaturally confident as God, remains asleep. You see, have you ever had a time in your life where there's a storm? Something sudden appeared that you weren't expecting. And you cry out to God, but yet you don't hear him. May I remind you that just because Jesus is silent, it does not mean that he is absent. He is right here. And though things are sudden, awful, earth shaking and shattering in our lives, Jesus in heaven 
is calm and assured of who he is as God, of his love toward you and his confidence in you. And so these disciples, some of them have have literally been raised on the Sea of Galilee fishing. A storm unexpectedly comes up and they're terrified. So much so that they say in verse 25, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Now, they have no idea how true that statement truly is. (laughs) Obviously, the disciples as seasoned fishermen had done everything possible to save themselves, but could not. The harder they tried, the clearer it became. The solution to their problem can only be met in Jesus Christ. And can I say that God in his goodness will do the same for you? You can have all the education in the world. You can be as close and as vibrant in your faith as possible. And God will still graciously and kindly give things in your life, expose you to things in your life where literally the only solution is found, not in education, not in experience, but in Jesus Christ. Desperation for Jesus is sometimes the only time we are willing to receive inspiration and instruction from Jesus. There is just an willingness and an openness. Jesus truly is sometimes the only one we ever truly need when we realize he's the only one we have. And in light of that, God graciously, through his Son, and through his Holy Spirit, ministers to us and comforts us and equips and empowers us to live a life not of fear, but by faith. God never wastes fear. If there's certain things that all of us, because of our amygdala and and because how we have learned and have taught ourselves that we're to fear, God graciously provides answers. So all of us have some sort of fear of the uncertainty of the unknown. That is why we need God's word. For the psalmist says in Psalm 119, 105, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It illuminates my heart. It directs my life so I can step forward, not by fear, but by faith in confidence in what you're asking me to do. That's why Paul says in Romans 1, 16, in regard to the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's a power unto God, unto salvation. It is power that can transform my life. It can literally move me where once I was fearful. Now I can live by faith and confidence in who God is and what he says he will do. Some of us struggle with the fear of attention or a failure. And that's why we need to remind ourselves of our identity is not seen in what we do or couldn't do, but in what Jesus Christ has already done. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live not by fear. I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave his life for me. The moment we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we die to a thinking that we are dependent upon ourselves that we trust in ourselves, that our security is found in us and us alone. No, we wholeheartedly admit we need Jesus. And thus our security is not in what we do, but in what he has already done. Thus our identity is not based upon performance, how we deal with fear, but rather by faith that Jesus Christ says it is finished. We live by faith not by fear. Some of us also have a fear of change. And that is why we constantly need to be reminded of the immutability of Jesus Christ. As the author says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus will always be there for you. Jesus will always love you. Jesus will always willingly allow things in your life to remind you that you need him most. Yesterday, today, and forever. Live by faith, not by fear. Some of us have a fear of conflict. And so we compromise some relationships because we don't want to lose them. 
because we find our satisfaction in some things instead of someone, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to remind ourselves that God doesn't love us like that. God doesn't put conditions on our love. God God doesn't change how he loves you based upon whether you love him or not. No, he just loves you. It's that same assurance that God gave Joshua when Joshua was overwhelmed with life and a responsibility of leading God's people to promise. He says in Joshua 1.5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear. Live by faith. You see, fear keeps you from what you need most. Fear provides a false sense of comfort, a false erroneous sense of security. And really what it does, it'll stunt you physically and it'll cripple you spiritually. Ironically, one of the last places that the disciples ever truly wanted to be was the exact place they needed to be. Jesus is sleeping because these disciples needed this storm. They needed to be reminded that there is someone greater outside of you. He's inside through your faith in Jesus Christ. And they need to be reminded of that truth. You see, if if we're not careful, we'll remind ourselves that strong faith always needs to be strengthened. That regardless of of where we are in our walk with the Lord, we we always need to be encouraged and strengthened. And so God will graciously bring trials. God will graciously allow things in our lives that will stretch us and thus strengthen us to be more and more like Jesus. Jesus is here. Save us, O Lord, we're perishing. Verse 26. And he said to them, why? Are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was this great calm. You see, Jesus gently rebukes his disciples. Why are you so timid? Why are you so cowardly or fearful? Oh, you have no faith, the gospel of Mark says. (laughs) Some of you, you just want to be like, I'm sorry, what? Hello, Lord, there, storm. (laughs) <laughs> There's this waves are, are crashing in on us. We're in a little boat here. This thing is going to sink. You see, Jesus centers their attention on a greater challenge. Not the storm, but their faith. There was something greater than the threat of the storm. It was the reality of their faithlessness or their lack of trust. These disciples reared in the Old Testament They would have known of Yahweh's complete sovereignty over the winds and the waves in the Old Testament. They would have known God in Psalm 104, 107, Job 38, Jonah 1 and 2 can control the wind and the waves. Additionally, the disciples had already seen Jesus heal every disease and affliction exposed to him in Matthew 4 verse 23. Cleanse someone of leprosy in Matthew 8, 3. Cast out demons in Matthew 8, 24. What is one storm to the one who made the heavens and the earth and can do those things? Fear is faith in the wrong thing. These disciples' greatest challenge was not this storm, but their faith. Fear is choosing to trust in the wrong thing. And obstacles reveal faith. Fear confirms faith. Fear verifies what you are placing your trust in. And Jesus, knowing that to these disciples, he gently rebukes them. He gently reminds them of who they are by displaying who he is. And the Bible says in verse 26 that he stands up and he says to the winds and the sea, peace, be still. And instantly the storms subside. A drastic contrast from verse 24 is Matthew's point. This storm is turbulent, awful. A great tempest arose. Not good. 
Then Jesus speaks and it stops. It ceases. The only thing more sudden than the storm's arrival was its conclusion. And God, through his son, has the same desire for you and for your problems. You see, Jesus is above your problems, but he's not beyond them. So many times we live in fear because we try to take a responsibility that we were never meant to take. We try to fix something that only Jesus can fix. And so instead of living by faith and of trusting the Lord, we in turn, we trust ourselves. And things don't go the way we think. And then instead of praying and repenting, we start thinking more and more and more. And that leads to hypothetical contingencies that do not even exist. And thus fear reigns in our lives. See these disciples, they tried everything possible to save themselves and couldn't. And finally, they come to Christ. He's asleep. He wakes up and instantly the storm ceases. Jesus is above your problems, not beyond them. Truly trusting Jesus's will and way is truly the only remedy for fear in your life. Now, I'll remind you that his timing is always perfect. And so some storms and some problems, Jesus will immediately relieve. Some will linger. Some God will allow to shape you and to strengthen you to who he desires you to be in Christ. And in doing so, we still trust the Lord. Jesus, you love me and thus you will care for me. And Jesus, knowing you're here, is all I need to know to get me there. We beat the curve when we understand that Jesus loves us and will care for us now and always. And as he stilled this storm, he can still the problems and the worries and the fears in your life. For Jesus is here. <laughs> I, I hope you never get over that truth. I know that these men didn't. In fact, look at verse 27. And the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Notice Matthew here uses men, not disciples. You see, these disciples were mere men who just witnessed a holy God as man. They've just seen something that was truly mind-blowing. It's like the, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The only thing more powerful than the storm around the boat was the power of God in the boat. And these men were literally moved to amazement. The astonished disciples were overwhelmed by who Jesus is and what he had done. And that same power and astonishment is available in your life. In fact, I want to give you three fearful truths about fear that once and for all, you can beat the curve, live in victory from fear through a life of faith. Number one, fear has a master. Fear needs to be reminded daily, you are not in control. Jesus is in control. So whatever it is right now, it's bringing you fear and anxiety and worry. Just write it down and literally say, you are not in control. Jesus is in control. Jesus has me and he's got this. Fear has a master. Secondly, fear is a reminder we need Jesus. Fear is something that's natural. You, you have an amygdala naturally that God has given you. And so when you have times of fear or apprehension, that could be God in his goodness reminding you, you need me, you need Jesus. What did Solomon say in Proverbs 1? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's an acknowledgement that you and I, we can't do life alone, that we need God in our lives 
through Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit to empower and equip us to be what God is encouraging us to live by faith. We need Him. Fear is a reminder we need Jesus. Finally, fear can only take what you allow it to take. If we're not careful, fear will take from you more than what you ever dream possible. And that's not God's responsibility. That's yours. Fear can only take what you allow it to take. There, there's a prominent book right now out on fear. And one of the, the primary chapters of that book is, is putting fear in the back seat. And it's an acknowledgement that, that, you know, there were to drive and to be control of our lives. And if we're not careful, fear will drive and control our lives. But, you know, fear is, is kind of naturally a part of, of just life and of, of growing and of knowledge. But, you know, just, just so put it, put it in the car somewhere. Just put it in the back seat. Well, I was telling Brenda this the other night and, and one of our babies came through and said, wait, 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 what are you supposed to put in the back seat, Daddy? And I said, oh, so put fear in the back seat. And they just said, well, well we're in the back seat. <laughs> it kind of it kind of hit me a little bit that you know actually that, that that's true that you know that fear doesn't just affect us fear affects those around us those those who love us and care for us and, and that's why we, we we have to make sure that we're, we're giving this to the lord that we're living by faith because if not fear will not only control and impact our lives it'll control and impact all those around our lives and so i said you know what maybe you're so right but where where should we put fear well well, Daddy, why don't we, let's just put it in the trunk. I <laughs> said, Dad, exactly. Put fear in the trunk and leave it there. You see, fear may have dominated your past. Fear may be trying to rule your day, but it doesn't have to drive your future. Beat the curve. Live a life not of fear, but by faith. And may you live in victory, knowing that in Christ, Jesus is.